Sociology is a discipline which is interested in the study of social groups okay, or society. It is also, it shares a lot with applied linguistics. It shares terminology, it shares research methods, and it is interested in, uh, in, in language and language phenomena, just like uh, applied linguistics. So it shares a lot with this discipline. And as a matter of fact, uh, this, this what we call marriage between sociology and applied linguistics gave rise to uh, sociolinguistics, the branch that is interested in uh, the study of the relationship between language and uh, society. Of course, in the beginning, sociolinguistics used to be uh, a branch of applied linguistics. But as we'll see later, after the decompartmentalization de that an, uh, applied linguistics undergone, it has become uh, an independent autonomous field. Applied linguistics may share a lot with computer science. So applied linguists are trying to uh, make use of the uh, of the, uh, of the findings in computer science to improve a number of areas. And applied linguists uh, cooperate with computer scientists to improve or to invent a number of technology <coughs> or technologies uh, which are used today. Okay. For example, uh, natural uh, language processing natural language processing is one of the uh, findings that are the results of this uh, cooperation between applied linguistics and computer science. Uh, speech recognition technology, speech recognition technology is also one of the uh, results of this cooperation. We manage somehow scientists manage to make machines understand human voice. And as a result of that, you can start your uh, computer uh, using your voice. You can, uh, cars function using a human voice. Pretty much all uh, smart uh, appliances and, and, and the machines can be controlled using uh, human voice. There is, uh, you can dial a number on your, on your phone using your, simply your voice. Okay. Let's say, uh, dial John. And then uh, your phone dials automatically the number of John. Why? Because your smartphone is equipped with this technology of uh, voice recognition or speech recognition. So again, uh, this is one of the results of this cooperation between applied linguistics and computer science. There's also the handwriting recognition technology, uh, which allows us to, uh, to write on screens using our hand, our fingers, or a special pen. And then it turns out into, uh, into alphabet or writing, okay? writing. So machines now are equipped with this technology, which allows them to understand our handwriting. Uh, what else? Machine translation or machine translators. Okay, now we have machines okay, in the form of uh, gadgets or small, uh, if you like, portable uh, devices, which can translate from uh, texts or voice from one language to another. And there are many more examples of this cooperation between computer science and applied linguistics. Psychology is, uh, I always prefer to call it the, 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 the mother of, of social sciences, psychology, because uh, perhaps all social sciences are in a state of interdisciplinarity or intersects with psychology. Uh, applied linguistics also intersects with this field borrows from it a number of research methods, borrows a number of terminology from uh, psychology, 
and it is also and we are also interested in the same issues especially language and how human beings use language uh, now this cooperation between psychology and applied linguistics gave rise to fields like psycholinguistics neurolinguistics and psycholinguistics how we can uh, and also uh, neurolinguistics which is the study of, of, uh, of how language functions in the brain, okay, language and in the brain. So these are a number of examples of the, if you like, the disciplines with which uh, applied linguistics share uh, a number of uh, terminology, search methods and issues. So far, so good. Are we good so far? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So let me proceed. So a little bit of history about applied linguistics. Now in your material, uh, and let me go back, show the, the, like the introduction of this course and tell you that in, in no way this uh, video lecture, or this live session or video lecture, if you're watching it later, uh, is enough to pass the exam. This video lecture is an attempt to summarize the content of the course, to explain uh, the content of the course, not all of it, of course, but a small portion of it. So it's in no way enough for you to pass the exam. You need to read the, uh, the booklet or the chapters in the reading material. That's important because we can't cover all the details in, in this short period of time. Okay. So if you, uh, normally you should read the, each chapter before we, uh, we, we have the, uh, the session so that you can come up with ideas, you can come up with questions, uh, things you didn't understand and you want us to, to explain. So in the uh, chapter, um, the nature and the scope of applied linguistics. The author proposed that applied linguistics can be can be can date back can date back to uh, ancient times, the Greeks, the uh, the Indians. But we will not go that far. Okay. We are interested. Well, the practice of solving a language-related problem is not a new one. But we are interested more in the, uh, the applied linguistics in its modern sense. So if you're talking about the concept of solving a language related problem, it's not a new one. It's as, as, it's as old as the, as the human being. But if you, we are interested more in the, uh, the discipline of applied linguistics in its modern sense. So we will not go back that far in history. So we, we are interested in the applied linguistics in the modern sense. That's why we, we believe that one of the events which signify the beginning or the birth of applied linguistics was the creation of the English Language Institute uh, at the University of Michigan in the US. Now, how is this, how does this mark the beginning of applied linguistics? It's simply because when this institute was uh, created in 1941, its aim was to make language uh, teaching a scientific practice. Now, it's important to remember this because we'll, uh, we'll build a number of assumptions on this later. So making language teaching a scientific practice, that was one of the early objectives of applied linguists. Okay. Before 
the appearance of applied linguistics, language teaching was not a scientific practice. It was just a craft like any other craft, okay? It's learned through uh, trial and error. It's learned through apprenticeship. If you want to become a language teacher, you observe a senior teacher, and then you imitate them. That's how it works, or that's how it worked back then. But since uh, 1941 and the, uh, the uh, if you like, the beginning of applied linguistics, Language teaching has become a scientific practice. So there's a number, there's a body of knowledge that you should know before you start teaching. There are a number of skills that you need to learn and develop before you start uh, teaching. All right. Another event which marked the beginning of applied linguistics is, of course, the uh, the appearance of a journal named language learning a journal of applied linguistics by the same university the university of michigan okay it's uh, it's the same one Uh, sorry for this interruption. So I was talking about how the appearance of language learning, a journal of applied linguistics, marked the beginning of applied linguistics. First, it was the first instance, at least in the US, because there's, an, there, there's another instance in the UK, it was the first instance in which the term applied linguistics was used in, in, a, in an academic publication. By the way, a journal is a publication, is a regular publication, which includes the results of research, uh, empirical studies, etc. It's not a newspaper, okay? <clears throat> it's, a, it's an academic, it's a journal, it's a publication where researchers publish the results of their, uh, their studies. That's a journal. And of course, later on, uh, later many other publications appeared dedicated to applied linguistics. Okay, there are many around the world nowadays. Okay, there are hundreds of uh, journals which uh, are interested or dedicated to uh, research in applied uh, linguistics, like the Applied Linguistics Review, the Journal of Applied Linguistics, um, etc. Okay, so there are many. Another event which uh, signify or uh, denotes, if you like, the, uh, the development of applied linguistics was the creation of, the, uh, of a center for applied linguistics in, at the University of Washington, okay? in Washington, DC. So a center for applied linguistics, a center a research institute dedicated to doing research in applied linguistics. This is important in the development of the field because it allows researchers to have, uh, to have a place and a context where they can carry out research. Nineteen sixties, uh, an association was founded. It was the TESOL Association. TESOL stands for Teachers of English as a, uh, for Speakers of Other Languages. So it's the Association of Teachers of English for Speakers of Other Languages. And it also refers to the practice, which is the teaching of English for Speakers of Other Languages. It's simply an, an, an association of American teachers of, of English. This is important because, as we said, 
uh, applied linguists wanted to make language teaching a scientific practice. And one of the ways to achieve this goal is to unite teachers in, uh, in associations, in groups, where they can meet, where they can network, where they can exchange uh, knowledge, practices, skills, etc. So again, this is one way of developing this, this field. Nineteen sixty four another association or organization was uh, was created it 's the Association of the International Association of Applied Linguistics now uh, the, the abbreviation is a i l a because it 's originally in French l'Association internationale de linguistique appliquée so this is the biggest association of applied linguistics around the world okay it has tens of thousands of subscribers and members uh, in almost uh, around the globe okay so and it's it uh, organizes its annual meeting uh, every three years so it is the biggest uh, organization which represents uh, if you like uh, applied linguistics and applied linguists and again, it is important in the development of the field because it allows uh, researchers in this field to uh, get together, to know one another, to exchange interests, uh, etc. So far, so good. Any questions? Right, if uh, there are no questions, let me proceed. The next section, of course, still with the history. Uh, 1941, we said that the English Language Institute, the creation of the English Language Institute was a, was a landmark or was a signpost of the beginning of applied linguistics simply because the teachers in this institute wanted or had as an objective to make language teaching uh, a scientific practice. More than that, uh, the, the, the people who were teaching in this institute, the teachers, and many of the uh, students who graduated from this institute became famous applied linguists. Okay? Many of them, many of the famous applied linguists that we know today were, especially the, the American applied linguists, were either teachers or students who graduated from this institute. So uh, these are some of the people who whom I'm talking about, so like uh, Charles C. Fries, the one on, on, the, on the left of the screen, Charles C. Fries was the first uh, headmaster or president, you like headmaster of this institute. So he's uh, one of the famous applied linguists. Diane Larson Freeman is another famous applied linguistics. Uh, she still lives and she, uh, she has very interesting uh, in fact, she has a number of interesting videos online that you can, uh, you can access and we'll need those videos for the next semester when we talk about the different teaching methods. So I do recommend you, <coughs> sorry, I do recommend you watch these videos of Diane Larson Freeman. H. D. Brown is another famous applied uh, linguist and uh, Larry Sillinger okay, is famous. Uh, for uh, a number of uh, theories in uh, applied linguistics. Okay. We'll mention these people uh, later uh, in, in different fields. So still with the history, I'm, I'm, I'm trying here to summarize the main events which led to the beginning 
for applied linguistics and also the development of this, of this field. 1966, the TESOL Association organized its first annual conference. Okay? <clears throat> so this is an event. Uh, this is important in the sense that, again, the uh, researchers get together, teachers get together to exchange practices, to uh, update their knowledge about language teaching, and to look for solutions of the problems that they may face. So this is important in the development of applied linguistics. 1967, in, in Britain, an, an, another association of teachers of English was uh, created. So it was the IATIFO Association. Now, IATIFO uh, stands for the International Association of Teachers of English as a Foreign Language. If you like, this is the equivalent, this is the British equivalent of the American TESOL. Okay, so it's an association of teachers of English. <coughs> 1967, the TESOL Association published the first issue of its journal, which is TESOL Quarterly. Again, another publication which uh, can function as an outlet for researchers and teachers to publish their results of their research. So this, uh, of course, contributes to the development of the field. In 1977, the uh, first PhD program was launched in the, uh, the first PhD program in applied linguistics, of course, was launched at the University of California. A PhD program is a program where you register to uh, get a doctorate, okay, to get a doctorate. And of course, when you get a doctorate, you become a researcher, you become a university professor, so you train other people in the field. So this is important. Such programs are important because they train uh, future researchers in the field. And of course, again, it contributes to the development of the field. In the same year, the uh, American Association of Applied Linguistics was born okay, to provide a context for people who are interested in doing research in, in applied linguistics in the US. Okay. So it's a context where these researchers get together, organize uh, annual conferences, uh, conduct research about the different issues in applied linguistics. I hope I'm not going fast, am I? Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, only 16 people can attend this, uh, this session. So in Europe, we talked about the US, uh, in Europe also there were a number of uh, if you like events which uh, prepared, if you like, or uh, paved the way for the appearance and development of the of the uh, of, of applied linguistics as a discipline. So in Europe in the 19th century, there was this separation between applied linguistics as a practice or as a, as a field or as, a, as an interest and philology, which is uh, a field uh, affiliated, of course, with linguistics, and it is interested in the study. Of, uh, of the history of language, history of words, relationship between languages, uh, which language comes from which language, etc. So, uh, in the 19th century, there, there appeared this separation between those people who are interested in language related problems, if you like, although they didn't call them that and those interested in the study of uh, relationship between languages and their history. Uh, sir. Yes. Uh, please, uh, the last uh, definition is uh, about philology. I didn't eat the word. 
Yes, philology is a discipline that is interested in, uh, well, in fact, it has a number of uh, different uh, definitions. On one hand, it is interested in uh, the study of the history and development of language and languages. Okay? It is interested in studying how languages develop and how languages are related to other languages. So also, on the other hand, it's interested in the analysis or the study of texts and culture. Okay? Texts in language and also the culture in relation to, to language. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Arabic tradition, philology is often referred to as fiqh uh, al and in our uh, Arabic tradition, we do have uh, a number of scholars, well, in the past, of course, who, who were interested in this philology. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the most quoted one, of course, is uh, Abu Mansur Ta'alibi, uh, his famous book, Fiqh al So it's, that's philology. In Europe, in the 19th century, uh, applied linguistics was used to refer to two main practices or two main fields, namely lexicography and grammar teaching. Okay. This is according to a linguist called Rask. Okay. For more details, uh, please go back to the chapter. Now, at that time, the, those people who were interested in solving language problems, they were interested mainly in two things, lexicography or the design of uh, dictionaries. So lexicography is the field interested in the design, in the writing of dictionaries. And they were also interested in uh, teaching grammar, how to teach grammar effectively. All right. Also in the in the in Europe in the 19th century, there was this 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 tendency called uh, Indo-European linguistics. Okay, it's the study of uh, Indo-European languages. Okay, and Indo-European languages are believed to come from one common language, and uh, linguists in the past have tried to rebuild this uh, assumed language. So this was an interest in linguistics that faded away with, with time. Now, those Indo-European linguists, those people interested in this field, uh, were or started to become interested in first and second language acquisition. Now, when these people, when these linguists, when these Indo-European linguists became interested in how people acquire first and second language, this marked the beginning of the, if it, or the appearance of applied linguistics in Europe. <clears throat> Another historical event which paved the way for the appearance and development of uh, applied linguistics in Europe was what is called the reform movement, okay? The reform movement. Now, the reform movement is simply a change in interest. Now, before the 19th century, most linguists were interested in the study of uh, language, especially written language, the study of the form of the written language. But in the 19th century, there came a group of uh, linguists, especially phoneticians, okay, 
linguists who are specialized in phonetics. Now, people like uh, Henry Sweet, Paul Passy, uh, Henry Sweet in Britain, Paul Passy in uh, France, and also Otto Jespersen in, uh, in Denmark, I guess. Now, these people, these phoneticians, came up with this idea that the oral language or the spoken language is as much important as the written one, if not more important than the written one. Okay, And uh, the new languages, the new modern languages should be taught instead of the uh, classical languages like Greek and Latin. And by the new languages, we mean the, the uh, French, Spanish, uh, English, uh, modern German, etc. So this is the reform movement, okay? This change of interest from the written language and from the classical languages, study of classical languages to the spoken language. This is the reform movement okay, by these people. Now, this is related to uh, the development of applied linguistics because these uh, people who led the reform movement were also interested in solving language-related problems. Another event in Europe which led to the development of applied linguistics was, of course, uh, the, the beginning of of the teaching of commercial English. Okay? Uh, teachers started to uh, teach English for purely commercial reasons, for people who wanted to use it for trade. Okay? And how is this again related to applied linguistics? It is related in the sense that we uh, teachers realized that a special English was needed for a specific group of learners. Okay, a special English was needed for a special group of learners. So there should be a special uh, syllabus should be designed. A special, perhaps, teaching method should be designed or chosen or used to suit the needs of these people. So again, this is making uh, the teaching of languages, especially English, uh, a scientific practice. So uh, these are some events which led to the uh, appearance of applied linguistics, especially uh, in, in Europe in the 19th century. Now in the US, In the US, applied linguistics in the, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century was uh, mostly associated with the structuralism in, 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 in linguistics, meaning that applied linguistics uh, was triggered, if you like, with the, the, the practices of structural linguistics, the, the, uh, the theory which considers language to be a set of systems, a set of systems, the phonological system, morphological system, uh, lexical system, etc. And in the early and mid, especially in the early 20th century, in the US, uh, applied linguistics was was considered to be a branch of linguistics to the extent that uh, many preferred back then to call it linguistics applied. Why? Because simply what was applied in solving language related problems was simply the theories of language. So theories from linguistics. That's why it was called linguistics applied. Because the only thing which was applied was linguistic theories. Of course, things change later. The 
one of the fields that uh, received a lot of attention from applied linguists in the early 20th century in the US was translation. Uh, a lot of effort was put in doing research about translation and producing better translations. Why? Simply because there was this interest of uh, translating the Bible into the uh, languages of the indigenous Americans, especially Native Americans, in this attempt to convert them to Christianity. So this was one of the uh, concerns of uh, applied linguistics back then, uh, producing a better translations of the Bible uh, for the purpose of uh, converting Native Americans to, into Christianity. Nineteen forties, of course, after the creation of the English Language Institute, which aimed to uh, teach languages scientifically. Now, this approach, okay, which uh, in the chapter they called it the applied linguistic approach, it was used since nineteen forties. It was used in the teaching of languages. So teachers started to teach languages scientifically. Uh, and this was uh, a mark of the beginning of applied linguistics. Anthropologists also adopted this approach, this applied linguistics approach, in teaching uh, languages. Remember that anthropologists, especially uh, those specialized in linguistic anthropology, are also interested in uh, language, language teaching, language learning, language acquisition. One of the uh, one of the famous uh, applied linguists who influenced anthropology a lot was Bloomfield, uh, 1930s. And uh, so in, this, in, in the 1930s, there was this attempt to uh, use the applied linguistics approach in teaching foreign languages. And of course, uh, Bloomfield was one of the leaders of this, uh, of this attempt. Right, let me summarize uh, this section on the history of applied linguistics. So we can, uh, we said that although the practice of solving a language related problem is, is, is as old as the human beings themselves, uh, we are interested in the applied linguistics in its modern sense. So uh, we, we believe that applied linguistics uh, started between the US and, and, and Europe. And one of its, one of the events which marked its beginning was the creation of a number of uh, institutes, like the English Language Institute, the, uh, the Applied Linguistics, Applied Linguistics Center in the, at the University of Washington, and also a number of publications led to the development of applied linguistics, such as the uh, Language Learning Journal, the TESOL Journal, okay? and of course, the events which these organizations, and of course, the organizations themselves, organizations such as the TESOL Association, the IATIFL Association, uh, and the events which the conferences which these associations or these organizations uh, organized okay, regularly. In, in Europe in the 19th century, of course, uh, this, the change of interest of linguists have marked the beginning of applied linguistics. So a number of linguists uh, started to become interested in, 
solving language related problem instead of uh, instead of uh, describing the nature of, of language so this is like a summary of of this section the next our next section if you don't have any questions is the uh, scope of applied linguistics okay the scope, by the scope, we simply mean the boundaries, the frontiers, where applied linguistics start and where does it end? When do I know that I am within applied linguistics and when I have transcended applied linguistics and went or, or uh, uh, into other fields? How do I know that if I'm researching a topic, I'm still within the field of applied linguistics. So roughly speaking, applied linguistics is interested in any situation which involves language, language use, or language users. And of course, you can think of hundreds of situations that involve language, language use, and language users. So these three elements uh, denote the frontiers, the scope of applied linguistics and of course from this scope we can deduce the sub branches or the branches let's call them the branches the branches of applied linguistics right uh, these branches are mentioned uh, in details in your reading material so one of these is of course second language acquisition since its beginning, applied linguistics was interested and is still in how people acquire uh, first language and second language, and also foreign language. So second language acquisition is one of the main branches of applied linguistics. We are interested in explaining how people come to acquire a second language. Another branch is the second language, so L2 here is an abbreviation that I'm using. It's the same abbreviation that is used in the reading material. So L2 simply means second language. So second language reading and writing research. Okay, how do people read and write in, in, in second language? How can this be uh, improved, etc.? Language learning and language teaching. Okay, this is one of the main concerns of applied linguistics, and it concerns us as well, because ultimately we are being introduced to applied linguistics so that we can uh, understand and be able to work uh, as language teachers. So language teaching and language learning. How can we improve language teaching? What theories are... Uh, are used in language teaching, what methods are used in language teaching, how are these methods related to each other, which method is effective, do we still need methods, etc. Okay. And by the way, it's important to know these branches so that when you are in front of a topic or an issue, you could be able to uh, locate it within the scope of applied linguistics. Language assessment, okay. We will be dealing with language assessment in details next semester. So language assessment is interested in the, uh, how we design tests, quizzes, what principles should be uh, respected when we design um, a test. Language policy and language planning is another branch of applied linguistics. It's interested in, uh, it's usually language plus politics in an area where more than one language is used. There are a number of choices that should be made. Okay, so which language should we use uh, in education? Which language should we use uh, in media, in uh, in the public administration, etc. So language planning 
language policy. <clears throat> Bilingualism and language in contact. Okay. Again, in an area where two languages are used, there are a number of problems which arise, such as uh, the, this natural conflict competition between languages. Whenever two languages are used in an area, there's always a competition between these two languages because uh, there's a competition, of course, for power. Language means power, so how do we solve this problem? What happens uh, when two or more languages meet? Okay, uh, how do we solve this issue of uh, these two or more languages? And of course, we have the same case in Morocco, right? We have the same case in Morocco. The, uh, we have more than one language being used, okay? Um, you don't have to use your cameras if you, if you don't want to, okay? As long as you, you can see me, it's, uh, I think it's fine. So you can, you can deactivate, deactivate your cameras if, because they also, they may uh, slow down the, your connection. All right, so another branch is language use in professional contexts. Language use in professional contexts. This means uh, all the issues, right? All the issues that are related to uh, the use of language in a, in a professional setting. It could be a hospital, it could be a, work, a factory, it could be uh, any professional context, okay? For example, what languages, what language should we use in Moroccan hospitals? Should it be French, Moroccan Arabic, or a foreign language, right? What languages should we use in courtrooms, okay? Um, Etc. So language in a professional context. This is the big area of interest for applied linguists. And then the corpus linguistics. Corpus linguistics, it's a, it's, a, it's a branch that is interested in the study of large linguistic data, okay, large linguistic data. And the results of this uh, are quite interesting, okay. Now, to simplify this, let me give you an example. Now, when you, when you search a word in Google, okay, the moment you write the first three letters of the word you're looking for, now Google offers options. For example, if you write E-D-U, E-D-U in, in, in the Google search bar, uh, I'm sure the first word, one of the first words that, you will be, that will be suggested by Google is education. Now, why did Google suggest education? It's simply because Google uh, has collected a large amount of data, especially research words, and has run the statistics and found out that, good, that education is one of the, uh, is, is perhaps the most researched word, okay, by running statistics. Now, this process is part of corpus linguistics, okay? part of corpus linguistics. So this is an example to illustrate this corpus linguistics uh, branch. But of course, the field is bigger than this, and it's, uh, it's an interest in applied linguistics. So in second language acquisition, as I said, uh, there are sub-branches or smaller branches like cognitive second language acquisition, Okay. It has to do with everything. It has to do with how uh, language is acquired, what cognitive processes are involved in acquiring a second language. Also, how is how the socio, uh, if you like, 
the sociolinguistic context? How does it influence second language acquisition? How does culture affect the way we acquire a second language? Pragmatic uh, second language acquisition, right? The speaker's intended meaning. Okay? How does it affect uh, the way we acquire second language? And then, of course, there are social and psychological uh, underpinnings of second language acquisition. So this is to, if you like, give you examples of the sub-branches of this second language acquisition area. Now, when we deal with second language acquisition, which is the, uh, in this chapter, not in this chapter, but in this semester, we will be interested mostly in uh, the cognitive second language acquisition, uh, perhaps a little bit of sociolinguistic, and social psychological factors, especially the, the theories. Neurolinguistic second language acquisition, it has to deal with how language, uh, as I said earlier, how language is, uh, is processed in, in the brain. The uh, language, second language reading and writing research, so this simply deals with the uh, research on how people read, learn to read and learn to write in a second language. So here I'm, I'm, I'm just giving some uh, details about each of these uh, sub-branches of applied linguistics. But I think we can, we can skip these details since you have them in, in your uh, in your uh, material. So you can always go back to them. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, move a little bit further to uh, more, if you like, pressing issues, namely yes, namely this one, this branch. So we would not be interested in all the branches in our course, either this semester or the next semester. We'll be interested mostly in uh, language teaching and language learning. So language teaching and language learning is another branch of applied linguistics. And uh, one of its sub branches is second language teaching. What methods can be used to teach a second language? How can we achieve a high level of proficiency in, in, in English? Uh, so language teacher education as well. Foreign language teaching will be one of our interests. Right? We will not dwell a lot on bilingual education. We might mention it just briefly. Minority language education is one of the interests, of course, of language learning and language teaching sub-branch. It's when you have uh, a group in society who speaks a language different from the language that the majority of people speak. So in this case, a number of problems arise, uh, especially in education. What happens is this minority of people would require their language to be used in education. They would require the government to provide education in their own language uh, at schools. We do not have minority language issues in Morocco yet, but perhaps with the uh, immigration waves, perhaps uh, maybe uh, in the future, we, we might have uh, minority language issues. Industrialized countries, on the other hand, like, like France, like uh, the US, like, uh, European countries have minority language education simply because there are 
larger minority, if you like, groups in society. Take, for example, the Moroccan immigrants in France. Uh, one of the things that they need is uh, education, to provide education in the Arabic language. Instructional approaches, anything that has to do with, with the, the methods and approaches of teaching a language. Okay? We have uh, a special chapter on this in, in, in the coming uh, sessions. As I said, language assessment is interested in uh, designing tests. How can we guarantee a high level of test validity? How can we guarantee fairness in testing? And how can we achieve performance assessment? Many educators uh, believe that we should assess, we should use more performance assessment, assessment that deals or that captures uh, what learners can do with language. So language skill constructs, okay. And uh, technology in language assessment is another issue uh, under language assessment. So technology is used in teaching. It's also used in language assessment. This gave rise to uh, things like CAT, Okay. Computer assist testing, many standardized tests nowadays have become computer based. Uh, many assessment instances now are taking place uh, online and not face to face. Language policy and language planning, as I have mentioned earlier. Uh, is interested in any context where two languages or more are used in an area and the result of course could be a, bilingual, a need for bilingual education, education that is offered in two languages or multilingualism, okay, the fact of using uh, more than two languages in one area. Okay. I think this is the case in Morocco. A number of languages are used by the population to achieve different, uh, different goals. Now, the English only movement was a movement which uh, in the US which had or which had this objective of making English the official language of the US, the only official language of the US. Uh, maybe not many of you know this, but the US does not have an official language. Okay. If you think that the English is the official language of the United States, uh, that's not true. The, the American Constitution doesn't say anything about an official language. There was this attempt uh, years ago, there was this attempt to make English uh, the only uh, language, official language, but it failed for a number of reasons. So, societal bilingualism and language contact is interested in uh, how dialects uh, are born, how new dialects are born, and uh, how language spread over an area. Okay. What factors uh, makes it possible for a language to be used uh, widely over an area? Language shift. Okay. It's simply the fact of changing the language we use. Right? A whole population of an area can shift from using one language to another. This doesn't happen, of course, uh, in a short time, but it happens over decades. Okay? Language death, okay. of course, languages die when the last person who speaks that language dies. Or when these languages are no longer used, 
so we consider them to be dead languages. So how does it happen? How does uh, how do languages die? What could be done to revive some languages? You know, it's possible to uh, revive a dead language. Language use in professional contexts may involve issues like translation. Okay, how can we come up with a better translation? Interpretation, so this oral translation. The language used in the courtrooms, okay, by the judge, the litigants. And also the language used in hospitals, in clinics, in healthcare institutions by uh, medical doctors and also patients. And this sub-branch also includes scientific writing, okay? How can we improve the uh, writing of uh, manuals, uh, guides, okay, etc. So this is another area. Uh, we may not be interested in it uh, in this course, but it's important to know that it, it does, it is part of applied linguistics. And of course, the last one we, we mentioned was corpus linguistics. And as I said, corpus linguistics was the, is the study of large uh, quantities of linguistic data. And why do we study large quantities of linguistic data? We use the results of this to write grammar books. Now, the, the grammar rules in a grammar book are not the only rules which exist in a language. There are far more rules than those compiled in a grammar book. But someone, the linguist, uh, makes a decision on which rules to include in a grammar book and which rules not to include. Dictionaries. Now, writing dictionaries and designing dictionaries is one of the results of corpus linguistics. So, uh, applied linguists here make decisions on which words to include, especially lexicographers, which words to include in a dictionary and which words not to include. You know that uh, the words in a dictionary are not the only words in a language. There are far more words. But uh, lexicographers or people who design dictionaries decide to include some words rather than the others for a number of reasons and dictionaries are updated uh, regularly to uh, omit the obsolete words, words which are no longer used, and to add new, new words. Again, this is the result of corpus linguistics. And we also use the results of corpus linguistics to design uh, material for language teaching. Okay? These are the three, if you like, one of, uh, these are three areas that makes use of the uh, results of corpus linguistics. All right, so uh, this is the end of this chapter. Uh, the last section we talked about are the scope, is the scope, sorry, of applied linguistics in which we uh, talked about the sub-branches of applied linguistics. Now, I assume by now you have an idea about what is applied linguistics, what are its sub-branches. And as you see, it's very large. It's a very large area of inquiry. But let me just uh, say this. Uh, in the past, especially in the beginning of applied linguistics, uh, the mid 20th century up to the 80s or so, uh, researchers in applied linguistics actually called themselves applied linguists. But today, uh, very few people call, would call themselves applied linguists. Why? Because applied linguistics is, uh, I hope you can still hear me, I got a sign here that the Connection is slow. Can you still hear me? 
Yes or no, yes. All right. So, I was saying that applied linguistics today has undergone a process of decompartmentalization. It simply means that these sub-branches of applied linguistics that we talked about, most of them have become independent fields. And people doing research in these fields do not call themselves applied linguists. So uh, a person interested in the study of uh, language and society would call himself a sociolinguist, not an applied linguist. Uh, a person interested in translation would call himself a translator. A person interested in, uh, in, uh, in training teachers would call himself uh, a language educator. Uh, 